Welcome everybody to another episode of Rangers Rando, and this is the All-Star Break Edition. We have three Rangers selected to the All-Star Game. We had a decent stretch for the Rangers going into the All-Star Break with a 2-1-1 record through four games, with the kid line being instrumental in gathering those points. We have the line blender coming back. Gerard Gallant is just mixing up lines left and right. And then we have the first major trade in what is going to be a very active next two months up until the next trade deadline. So we have a bunch to talk about, not a lot of time to do it. Let's go. So, All-Star break. We're going into the skills competition and the All-Star game. It's going to be in Florida this year. If you remember, last year it was in Vegas and they really incorporated a lot of what makes Vegas Vegas. They had something in the Bellagio fountain. They did, you know, different aspects of the skills and the game were tying into the culture and the atmosphere of the city that the game was being held in. So through different podcasts and outlets, it's been said that they're going to try to do the same thing with Florida. The head of planning for that game has said they're going to try to incorporate alligators or crocodiles somehow, maybe like in a moat. I definitely think they will do something to make the game or the skills feel similar to the atmosphere in Florida with palm trees and maybe with gators and the ocean, something like that. So that's really cool. I really like the retro All-Star jerseys. I think it's kind of a callback to sometime in the 2000s where the star is outlining the bottom of the jersey. So that's cool. It's definitely a throwback. Going on to the Rangers who have been selected as All-Stars. We have Igor Shesterkin. He was first person to actually get selected from the Rangers. And then there was the quote-unquote uh, vote, fan vote, to get players in. Really didn't seem much like a fan vote. It seemed like the NHL kind of had their picks already because Keandre Miller was one of the leading people to be All-Stars from the Rangers, and he didn't get selected. That kind of sucks because it would be awesome to get Keandre Miller or someone like him in. What happens is the Rangers did end up getting two more players selected, which is Artemi Panarin and Adam Fox. I have no problem with that. I'm sure these players don't mind uh, not getting selected because it means they have, you know, that whole week off to rest, recover, spend time with their families, their loved ones. So that is who we expect to see at the All-Star Game. Panarin, Fox, and of course, Shesterkin. Now, moving on to the Rangers' schedule through the last four games. We played Boston, Florida, Toronto, and the Vegas Golden Knights. And then we had, you know, a couple, like, three or four-day break going into the All-Star Game, which a lot of other teams didn't have. So that's kind of probably good for our guys who are a little banged up. But starting with Boston, really, you can't... They're the best team in the league by far. They have the least losses by far. It was a one or two goal game. I think it might have been 3-1. And Ben Harper had his only goal, which, you know, he he's earning that contract, that league minimum contract. That contract really isn't going to hurt the Rangers. Uh, it can be buried in the AHL. So if he needs to come off the cap, they can put him there. They can offload him onto some other team. They can wave him. Not a problem there. Back to the Bruins game, it really just, you got outplayed by a better team. It's not like a call for panic. If the Rangers want to make a run here, they will likely have to go through the Bruins at some point. So you got to hope that they add some pieces at the deadline or find out a way to play against them. Otherwise, it's going to be a pretty short series. The next game, the Florida Panthers. This was a game where every single line scored. You know, we had a power play goal from Mika. We had Jimmy VC. We had, I think, a Lafreniere goal, which the kids have really been heating up. That whole game, I think every kid on that kid line had two points. And it really seems like Gallant is sticking now with that kid line because you can see Heedle is just on fire. Heedle is heating up. That guy, Heedle as in heat because he is so hot. Oh man, he is producing points like crazy and especially on that kid line. You can see the confidence growing in Lafreniere being on that line. The way that they all play together and Kako also just Mr. Consistency with those two guys and really all year. That line is a headache for any team. You play them up and down the lineup. I think, you know, their possession in the offensive zone every game is it blows my mind so so that line sticking together i think is crucial down the stretch here that kid line is buzzing so hopefully gallant can keep it that way moving on to toronto there's a 3-2 ot loss and heedle had two goals really the kid line was the only line holding the team together and then you know of course gallant doesn't put them out in the first shift for ot and we get walked by Mitch Marner, who scores a kind of crazy goal. It really sucks to see that because, you know, the Rangers were within striking distance of 
getting the two points. So I think, you know, a little bit of a bad call by Gallant there, not putting your best line that night out, and it costs us a point at the end of the day. And now moving on to Vegas, I always, I keep giving Vegas too much credit because they have not had the season that they expected to, especially with getting Eichel back and having all these players uh, that they expect to play a little bit better. Of course, now they have their captain, Mark Stone, is out for the season. So they have kind of not been playing that great, and it showed when the Rangers played them. And the kid line again just dominated, just totally dominated this team. So the wins that we gathered were Panthers and Vegas. The loss, regulation loss, was to the Bruins, and the OT loss was to Toronto. So we had a 2-1-1 one, one stretch through four. We gathered five points. Not that bad through that stretch, because that is a difficult stretch. So going on to the lines, we already talked about the kid line. The kid line is set. I think they're going to just have that line be the second or third line, uh, just depending on where they put the Trocheck line. And the Trocheck line, I say that because he is the other top three center, right? Mika is bolstered at number one. And they've kind of moved, actually, Panarin off of Trocheck's line onto Mika's line the last couple games. So I think Mika and Panarin are going to be that top line going forward. It's just who do we slot in at that right wing spot? It was Kreider. Kreider had some bad games. He was hurt, but when he came back, he did not look the same. He did, was not producing and he was giving the puck away. So I think they put VC on that line. Kraftsov is nowhere to be found. Just being scratched. I, that doesn't make sense to me. I think he is he is got to be top of the list to be traded as like just a young prospect, um, not getting any playing time, who has this potential. And we need right wingers. Our right wing depth is shot. You're, you're having Kreider play on his offside, or you have VC, who should be a third to fourth line guy up on the first line. Meanwhile, you have this top-touted right wing prospect that you're just not playing. You don't have any confidence in. So I think he's gone. Really, what that leads to is, okay, so you have these openings. You have Panarin, Mika, right winger, whoever it is. Insert right winger here. You have Kidline. Then you have Trocek, Kreider, and maybe Goodrow, maybe VC. And then the fourth line is a mixture of, you know, VC, Goudreau, Gautier. Blay has been getting scratched pretty frequently. Uh, Brodzinski's been up and down. Lecision has, has been in the lineup pretty consistently. And then you have Will Cooley who came up. And I thought he held his own. In his first or second NHL game, he had a pretty big tilt. So I think that fourth line is we have a kind of a revolving door of guys, which is great, like, down the line to be able to have guys that can slot in at your fourth line. But... Really, that doesn't help offense. So what we need, that brings me to my next point. What we need at the trade deadline is, again, a right winger. So like Frankie Vitrano filled that spot last year. He filled in nicely as a right wing with Mika Kreider. I think we need a guy like that again. Someone who can fit on this top line. If Kreider can't, you know, make the transition to right wing, we need to sign a top six right winger. And then, you know, maybe get another third or fourth line guy who can just, if it's an improvement, because right now, like I said, we have a lot of depth, but if we can find an improvement there, a guy who can produce uh, and maybe play with Trocek and one of Kreider, VC, or Goudreau on the third line, then I think that makes sense. And then again, yeah, we signed Harper for a pretty low deal, and he scored that goal, his first goal in like five years or something. You're one injury away from having Hayek and Harper as your bottom D pairing, which is not something you want going to the playoffs. So you need to make a D sign. As far as names there, like, I'm just going to talk about one, and it's the big one. Patrick Kane. It seems like a pretty well-known thing now throughout the league that he has a hip injury and he's going to need, like, hip or knee surgery. That is not good going into, like, we're not going to, you want to spend prospects and players on Patrick Kane if he's just going to be out the rest of the season. Sure, maybe you sign him for a couple years after that, but you never know what you're getting with an injury like that. So I think that they should stay clear of that. Maybe next year if he comes back, is producing again, and his hip or knee or whatever is fixed, then you take a swing at him next trade deadline. If you do this now and you get rid of prospects, it could be an all-time blunder. The other guys we've talked about in other episodes, not much has changed there. What has changed, and something that I'm so glad the Rangers didn't do, is Bo Horvat. Bo Horvat traded from Vancouver to the New York Islanders, Metro Division rival, for Anthony Bavillier, who is a youngish, maybe like mid-20s player, former first-round pick. Atu Rati, who was, if he wasn't a first-round pick, he was beginning of second-round pick, but he used to be one of the top prospects of his class, and then he dropped for either injury or character reasons. So, essentially another first-round pick. And then, a first-round conditional for the th for 2023 and if it's a top 12 pick in 2023 it becomes a first round 2024 pick 
So the Islanders, essentially what this means is they gave a player who's established but was a first rounder, they gave a prospect who was a first rounder, and they gave a conditional first rounder this year, and if not, it'll be next year's first rounder. So three first round value for Bo Horvat, who, yeah, he's been having a good season. He's been one of the leading scorers on Vancouver, but Vancouver is a dumpster fire right now, and everyone knew that they had to get rid of Bo Horvat because they signed Andre Kuzmenko to the same exact number that Bo Horvat was making. And they even said, we can't sign both. Whoever deal we get done, the other one's moving. We need to rebuild with a new core. So Vancouver really didn't have any chips or leverage to play with. And the Islanders and Lou Lamarillo, Big Daddy Lou, dude, he's losing it. Just like gifted them three first round picks. It doesn't make sense. The Islanders are on the outside of the playoff picture looking in. They can't score. Their offense is just like, it's, it's just like a boring to watch, right? And you get a guy who is having a good offensive year, but is he the answer? Is he the guy that's going to just like take you to this next level and just carry you to the playoffs? No, I don't think he is. I think he needs the supporting cast that really the Islanders don't seem to have right now. So thank you, Chris Drury, for not doing something like that. That would have been, I just think that was a bad move. A bad move. We'll see. But like you're giving up your prospects. The Islanders don't have a deep prospect. And so you're getting rid of your young guys to go on a run with a bunch of old guys like Zach Parise and Kyle Palmieri. It's like, dude, I feel bad for Matt Barzell more than anything. He is a talent and he has not had support his whole career. Yeah, no. I think Lou has lost his mind. I think the Rangers are still in that good spot. I think we very well might see a Devils Rangers first round playoff series, which I am pumped for. All right, everyone, that's the show. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Please leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe. Uh, love you all, and let's go Rangers!